We are studying in, uh, of course, we're in Acts, and we're in Acts 23, by the way, for those of you who might not have been here. By those of you who have been here, we're in Acts 23. And we've been looking back <coughs> at Paul, who's who, has, who is defending himself before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Okay? He's been brought here by the Roman commander who wants answers for everything that's been going on in Jerusalem because he doesn't know. He hasn't understood. Uh, Paul has been explaining his, his life and everything to the Jews, but he's been explaining it in Aramaic. So the Romans don't have any idea what he's been saying. Um, when he got to the part that God told him, to take the gospel message to the Gentiles, that's when the Jerusalem Jews fell into an uproar. They threw off their cloaks, they got on their faces, and they threw dust all over themselves. And if you don't think the Romans thought this was strange, you know, they wanted answers. They had no idea what's going on. Well, the Roman commander ordered that Paul be brought to the barracks. You remember that. And to find out what was going on, he was going to examine him by scourging him. Well, Paul didn't really want to be scourged, so he... He told them he was a Roman citizen, and they don't scourge Roman citizens. So they take him off the, the rack or whatever they had him tied to, and Paul is brought into the barracks, where he then is kept safe. Then, the next day, the Roman commander ordered the chief priests in the Sanhedrin to be brought together because he wants to find out what's going on. So Paul starts his defense by greeting the members of the Sanhedrin and calling them brethren which is not really the way you address the Sanhedrin, but he did, because he knew most of them. Some of them he even considered as had, he'd been friends with them. Well, for some reason, that didn't sit well with the high priest. And so he had Paul struck across the mouth. And, um, and so Paul comes right back at him, and he, he calls him a hypocrite. He calls him a whitewashed wall. And he told him that God was going to strike him down for what he did. But then Paul found out he was the high priest. Now, I don't know why he didn't know he was the high priest. I figured the high priest had a special seat. But he didn't know he was the high priest. And so then he apologized, realizing that he should never have spoken evil of a ruler. And he quoted scripture, if you remember. And that's where we find ourselves today. <clears throat> today, we're looking this morning with Paul beginning to speak to the Sanhedrin. So let's start with that with Acts 23, verse 6. Who's got that? 23, verse 6. But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. Okay, so Paul sees that there are Pharisees and there are Sadducees. Of course he knows that. And, and so he speaks out. Once again, he uses the term brethren because he knows most of them. Okay? And he says, he says brethren. He says, he tells them, I'm a Pharisee, okay? Um, because he was a Pharisee, he's telling them just that. He says, I'm a Pharisee, and I'm the son of Pharisees. Paul comes from a long line of Pharisees, and he knew that there were a good number of the Pharisees there, and they would agree with his main premise, the premise of the resurrection of the dead, because that's what he's trying to promote here, okay? Remember, the Sanhedrin is made up of priests, uh, Priests, elders, scribes, Sadducees, and Pharisees. For the most part, the priestly families are the Sad and the high priests were the Sadducees. And the Pharisees came from and represented more the common people, okay? Whereas the Sadducees came from and represented the, uh, the um, upper class, okay? The Pharisees accepted the word of... We've, we've talked about this. The Pharisees accepted the written word of God, but they also accepted and believed in the oral tradition as well. And they, and they actually gave it equal authority with the written word of God, whereas the Sadducees only accepted the written word and only the first five books of Scripture. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the, the, the Tanaka. Well, the Pharisees believed in the spirit world. They believed in angels, they believed in spirits, and they believed in the resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees didn't believe in any of that. So this is where we have... A, a, a battle between the two. They, they, they disagreed on a number of things. And this, but this, this is the whole point that's going to divide them as Paul speaks. Okay? 
I mean, did Jesus, the Messiah, who, Je who Paul is calling the Messiah of Israel, did he die and then rise from the dead? I mean, the main issue here is, is the main issue here between these groups was indeed the resurrection. Okay? Paul has always preached the resurrection. And that's what is troubling the Sadducees. Paul preached that Jesus was alive and that he had actually spoken to him. And that very much upsets the Sadducees. Okay? Well, after the first Pentecost, after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead, the apostles then took the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, didn't they? Okay? And it was, but it was the Sadducees who took the lead in opposing the apostles and Christianity. Because the gospel is based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, the Sadducees could not let the, these teachings go unchallenged. So, especially after they'd been the ones who'd been accused of instigating Jesus' death. But during that time, the Pharisees actually seemed to gradually becoming less and less aggressive in their opposition to the apostles. They, they agreed with them from the resurrection from the dead. They just did not agree with them that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay? So they had issues here. And Paul saw these proceedings as being weighed down with non-essential things. And he wanted to establish the truth of the resurrection. And that's what he's doing here. So this, was his, this is what his testimony was all about. I mean, let's think about this. If he was to be condemned, let it be for something that will enable the Roman commander to recognize that what he is being charged with is actually something upon which the Jews themselves can't agree. And they really can't agree on the resurrection. Okay? So he's trying to, pull, he's trying to move his case toward that. If, it, if his trial could become a dispute over Jewish teachings, it would verify and it would verify and very much aid in Paul's case. And Paul's pointing, Paul is pointing out to the Sanhedrin that he is being condemned for something that is strongly held by many of them. The hope of the resurrection. I mean, every Pharisee lived his life with this aim in view, that he might attain eternal life and the resurrection from the dead. The Pharisees believed in this, okay? Paul finds himself on trial because of this, because of the resurrection of the Messiah, Jesus. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, he could not have appeared to Paul on the Damascus Road, could he? He could not have appeared to him at the temple. Had this not happened, Paul wouldn't be standing right here in front of the, uh, the Sanhedrin today. He'd still be out killing, killing Christians. All right, so that's where we are, and let's start at verse 7, seven and 8. Let's read on. As he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. Yeah, see, that's what, I've, that's what I've been talking about, preparing you for that, because there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I mean, this is what Paul's, Paul's words have been able to shift the focus of the court from himself to them, to their doctrinal differences, the differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And these differences have been debated for years because they disagree on these things. And that's basically what Paul is doing. I don't know if that was his intent, but when he spoke of the resurrection from the dead, this is starting this dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. All right, let's go to read verse 9. And there occurred a great uproar, and some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. Yeah, the Pharisees are finding themselves in a very interesting position. They're finding that they have more in common with the prisoner than they do with the um, Sadducees. Okay? Many of the Pharisees saw that what Paul was teaching was in their own system of belief, believable. I mean, here, we, here are some of the scribes of the Pharisees find nothing wrong with him. I said, I said, they said, we find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. I mean, that could happen, couldn't it? And I'm, that's what they're basically doing. They're saying, wait a minute, this could happen. Well, you say it can't, but we say it could. 
All right, let's read verse 10. And as a great dissension was developing, the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him back into the barracks. Yeah, I find this very interesting. The commander was afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces. This, might, this must have been getting quite heated. Okay, I, I can't imagine. You know, I didn't even notice that till this moment. That they, they took him because he'd be torn to pieces. But it seems that every time Paul speaks out, since he's been back in Jerusalem, it's ended in a riot mm -hmm. or, or an uproar of people, hasn't it? And I mean, once again, the Roman commander has another riot on his hands. Okay? He and he still hasn't found out what caused either of the first two riots. That's why he took him to, to, the, to the Sanhedrin, wasn't it? Because he wanted to find out what's going on. Well, he still doesn't know why Paul's been accused. And for the third time, Paul has for the third time, Paul has to be rescued from a mob by the Roman commander and then taken back to the barracks. He always seems to get taken back to the barracks, doesn't he? The commander must have been in quite a quandary. I mean, once again, he's stuck with this prisoner, who is a Roman citizen and therefore somewhat difficult to deal with. And it was apparent that none of Paul's oppo opponents were actually charging him with anything. So the Roman commander um, was having to, to hold him. He was having to, he was having to keep him, uh, he was having to keep him under lock and key at the risk of the consequences if there were going to be any, because he's a Roman citizen and hasn't been charged. But he's holding him because he's afraid, he's afraid for his safety. Okay? All right, let's read verse 11. But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. Yeah, things seem to be going, not to be going too well for Paul, do they? I mean, he's, he's not in prison. He's being held, right? He's being held in, uh, uh, under, I mean, he's been being held for safety. But once he by in the Roman barracks, okay. But there's one person who's very pleased with what's happening. Who is that? Who? I heard it. Jesus. Yeah, it's the Lord. Jesus. I mean, Jesus is pretty happy with what's going on here, and um, Jesus is right there standing with him, and um, and he's encouraging. He's standing there and encouraging. He tells him to take courage. Courage is the Greek word tharseo, which means to have courage to be of good cheer, to not be afraid. All that, and that's, that's what courage is. Take courage. Let's think about this, though. Paul is being held captive, and that night Jesus comes in, he's standing right there with him by his side, comforting and encouraging him. I mean, can you imagine how comforting that must have been for Paul? I mean, um, God, and folks, God is always, always there and available in our need for comfort. And we see that um, when Paul actually wrote to the Corinthian believers, and this might have, what he's, where he's being comforted here, this might have played a big part in it. Let's read 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which our, we ourselves are comforted by God. Yeah, there's a lot of comfort in there, but it's a wonderful verse. <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. Why? So that we might be able to take that same comfort to others. I mean, if you've ever noticed, if you've experienced something, you're so much better at comforting somebody who's going through the same thing, right? Well, Paul's going through a lot. I don't know if that's where his comfort comes from, but, but the Lord is there right now with Paul, and he's comforting him. I mean, Paul's a prisoner, a marked man, hated by many, if not most, of the Jews in Jerusalem, okay? And he's directly under the protection of Roman soldiers. But you know, if you had Jesus stand there and all of a sudden he said, you know, you're going to testify in Rome. Yeah. He knows he just got a reprieve at least. Mm -hmm. You got a reprieve. That's right. I mean, yeah. You make it to Rome. You're going to make it to Rome. Because you're not going to say, are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about discouraged he must have been. I mean, that basic, yeah. I mean, basically, you've just shared my next paragraph. I mean, that's, bro, he knows he's going to Rome. 
He's comforted. He's ready, and, and he's not. I don't think he's worried about this anymore. Okay, let's read verse 12 and 13 from Acts. Uh, when it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves <clears throat> under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who formed this plot. Yeah, okay, so now it's morning. We know that because it says when it was day. So it's now morning. And in the morning, it is, this is the morning after the night where Jesus was just right there with Paul. Okay? And now Luke tells us about a plot that the Jews are planning. Okay? What he says there is the Jews bound themselves under an oath. And basically the Greek here says that they anathematized themselves with an anathema. Because the, they, they're using this word anathema a lot because it's about they bound themselves with a bond. They bound themselves with an oath. And this oath was that they would neither eat nor drink until Paul was dead. Okay? So I guess they never did. Well, I guess they never did. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, uh, you know, clearly they expected this to go quickly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Clearly. Paul sent out the yeah. sides of one I mean, why, so why did these men hate Paul so much, do you think? I mean, he'd never harmed them. They were angry. He never <laughs> stole from them. <laughs> By now, they're angry. It's <laughs> hard to track somebody down when yeah. you're starving. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they're losing their power if, if Jesus is the Messiah. They're going to be losing. That's it. And, but they're, they're not only losing their power, they hated him because he's taking all this to the Gentiles. Because the Jews still don't understand that the gospel is supposed to go to the Gentiles. It's even in the Old Testament. It's in, it's, in the, it's in the Hebrew Bible. But they don't get it. They don't see it. Okay, Because it's kind of been blocked from them. God's done this. He's blocked it from them. They don't see it. They hated Paul because he was <laughs> preaching to the Gentiles. And, their message, that, that their me and they believe that message must be silenced. All right, let's read verse 14 and 15. They came to the chief priest and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case by a more thorough investigation. And we, for our part, are ready to slay him before he comes near the place. Yeah, so the Jews come to the chief priest and the elders. And... These men, these were part, these men were part of the Sanhedrin, and these were definitely Sadducees. And these Sadducees were the ones that were antagonist, antagonistic against Paul. You know, Paul taught about the resurrection, and these were anti-resurrection people. So the, the high priest, and the high priest probably never forgave Paul for calling him a whitewashed wall. I mean, but you know, that was only a couple days ago, but he, he didn't like that. The Jewish conspirators, though, who wanted Paul dead, they must have known that the leadership in is of Israel was morally decrepit. These men were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of Israel, but they we, now that we see them becoming part of a plot to kill God's messenger and God's apostle Paul, and he, they know they know the rumors are true, and they know about how bad Ananias was. So that's why they're going to these chief priests and they're saying, "This is what we want to do." Well, they tell the Sadducees that they want this done quickly because they say we'd like to eat and drink again soon, you know. And uh, they are asking the chief priests and elders to have the Roman commander bring Paul to them again the next day or, one, a, a, or a day, on a day, and they, they are going to be standing in wait for him to kill him. And there are 40, 40 of them that are going to do it. And, you know, these, compares, these conspirators must have, they, they knew that, that Paul would be brought to the Sanhedrin by an armed Roman guard. And that guard was going to fight back at him, wasn't it? I mean, they were armed. And they would, and, but they hated Paul so much that they were willing to die in order to kill him. Okay? And that, that seems very strong to me, but it, when you think about that, they know there's going to be a battle. And but there's 40 of them, and there's probably not 40 of the Romans. So well, they, they took a huge risk. Yeah. Because not only were they, you know, want to kill Paul, but in the ensuing fight, they could have killed a Roman soldier, which would have brought, like, the Rome down on their heads. Yep. Yeah. But, bad. So they. But they don't like Rome either. So. Yeah. You know. So I guess they really they they were willing to sacrifice whatever it took. That's what they're and they 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 said we need to do this because of what this man is doing. Yeah. 
So what we're seeing is that Paul appears to be in great danger now, doesn't he? And things seem to be going from bad to worse for Paul. But you know, this is only how it appears. All, it's all part of God's providential plan for Paul. It's all part of Paul's ticket for a safe departure out of Jerusalem and on, on, on his way to Rome. Everything right now is in God's hands. All right, let's read verse 16. This just goes to show how hard it is to keep a secret. <coughs> <laughs> but the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. All right, so here we see that Paul's nephew... And you probably knew Paul had a nephew, but I didn't. I, I've read this before, but forgot Paul had a nephew. Forgot he had a sister, okay? There's all the, he, he was the son of Paul's sister, and he heard about this ambush. This was probably no coincidence that Paul's nephew just happened to be where they were planning all this. This couldn't have been a coincidence. This had to be God's providential, um, providential um, plan, ensuring that Paul would get word. All right, so he hears it, and Luke tells us that his nephew came to the barracks to tell Paul. And being a Roman citizen, Paul had certain freedoms to receive visitors. Because, you know, he's under lock and key, but only probably under house arrest in the barracks. So his nephew comes to tell him. And, you know, this is the only time in Scripture that we see, that we hear about Paul's family, other than when he talked about his father being a Gentile. I mean, we really don't know anything else about Paul's family. We just know about Paul. But we know very little about it. We know he has it. We now know he has a sister, and she had a son, so he has, has a nephew. But he did tell the Philippians in his letter to them about his faith in, G in Jesus Christ. Because of that, it said he suffered the loss of all things. Okay, now this could, have, this could have included being disinherited from his family because that's what they did. If you chose to go away from the faith to Christianity, you were disinherited and the, your family had nothing to do with you. That could be part of it. We really don't know that. But after saying that, we don't see, we don't see or hear anything about Paul's family. This is the only time we hear about it. We know of his father, his sister, and his nephew. Also interesting that he was from Tarsus, and he yeah. went back to Tarsus for a while. He did, yeah. So there was still family there, evidently. There is. But now his nephew is in Jerusalem. Well, it's, well oh, yeah. It's Jerusalem. Yeah. It's Jerusalem. Yeah. What? Okay. Well, remember, a lot of people are in Jerusalem because this is Pentecost too. So you know that could be why they're in Jerusalem. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. Well, how many uh, Romans were in Jerusalem? Do we know how many like true oh, Romans? You mean Roman, like, Romans, Romans, soldiers, or were they just soldiers, or were they like? I can I know. I read it one time. I want to say six hundred, but I think there's probably more than that. Yeah, I don't know. I'll look up. I'll the check into it. Yeah. Force that was in Jerusalem. Yeah, there might be some in scripture that tells us. The Romans didn't. Nobody wanted to live there. Nobody wanted to live there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's read. Um, let's see. Uh, 2317. I don't think we read that yet, have we? <clears throat> Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Lead this young man to the commander, for he has something to report to him. Yeah, I mean, can you see Paul? Okay, uh, okay you sure about this? I mean, you're sure that's what you heard, right? And, and he did. He heard it. So he said, Okay, uh, the, the Roman commander needs to hear this. So he goes to the centurions who are guarding him, and he says, Take this boy, lead this young man to the commander. He's got something to tell him. Okay, and uh, Paul's request would have been received with um, respect because he is a Roman citizen and they know, and all the guards know that. Okay, so let's go on with 18 and 19. Who's got that? I've got that. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called <coughs> to him and asked me to lead this young man to you since he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand and stepping aside began to inquire of him privately. What is it that you have to report to me? Okay, so we, we see the centurion. He leads the young man to the commander. And the centurion, the centurion tells the commander, he says, Paul the prisoner has asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to tell you. Well, this is Paul from now on. Paul the prisoner. Okay? He's called Paul the prisoner. And Paul actually uses those same words five times in Scripture. And when he's writing his epistle, in three of his epistles, he's got, he calls himself a prisoner five times. 
Let's let's look at that in Ephesians three verse one. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles. Okay, Paul indeed calls himself a prisoner, but of whom is he a prisoner? Jesus. Jesus Christ. He's not worried about the Romans, is he? But they're calling him a prisoner because he is a prisoner of Rome right now. And so they're calling him a prisoner, but Paul looks at it differently. I'm a prisoner of Christ, right? All right, so um, evidently Paul's nephew, though, must be a young boy, but old enough to be able to repeat what, had been, what he'd heard and old enough to be credible with the Roman commander. He's not just a little boy, okay? I mean, but how could this young boy, this man, this young man or this boy, hear of this plot? You know, maybe the men who were planning it, they were, plan they were making all their plans, and they didn't worry about this boy that was over here. You know, because if he'd have been a younger man, they might have worried about him, you know, because he would have known what was going on. But this is more of a boyish, um, and he, they didn't worry about him, but they just didn't know he was related to the one they were going to kill. So this young man, this boy, he must have been a boy, because in verse 19, we see, in verse 19, we see that the commander takes him by the hand and leads him aside. That he's not going to take an adult by the hand and lead him aside. He might put his hand on his shoulder, move him, but I can't see him grabbing his hand to say, let's go here. Because what they're doing is taking him by this, the hand to take him someplace where he can ask him privately what he heard. Okay? And that's what he says to him. He, say, he, he says to him, tell me. He takes him aside and says, tell me, what, ha, what, what, what is this that you want to report to me? And let's read... Um, verse 20 and 20, uh, let's uh, read uh, 20 and 21. And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them, for more than 40 of them are lying in wait for him who have bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they slay him. And now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. Yeah, the boy now tells him exactly what he'd heard. Okay? He tells the commander that the chief priests are going to ask you to bring Paul to them so they can ask him some more questions. Now, don't listen to them. There's a group of 40 men that are going to be waiting to kill him. And um, they have even taken this oath not to eat or drink. So, so there's no doubt, though, that the commander must have asked him a lot more questions. We don't have everything. you know, But the commander must have tried to find out everything he could, his source of information, and see, to, to see that he was satisfied with what this young man, this boy, was telling him. Um, but what he heard, I think, was very typical <laughs> of what Ananias, the high priest, would have done, and the despicable man that he was, that he would have done that. So the Roman, knew, the Roman guy knows that. The Roman commander knows that. So let's see what he says in verse 22. So the commander let the young man go, instructing him, tell no one that you have notified me of these things. Yeah, I mean, he says, he says okay, now you can go, but don't tell anybody that we've talked. Okay? Nobody needs to know anything. This needs to be kept quiet. But do you see the contrast here bet between, that we we're seeing it here in Luke's writing, the contrast between the Roman commander and the Jews. I mean, we're seeing mm -hmm. kindness. We're seeing lawful protection from the Roman commander, aren't we? But that's in contrast to the murderous, conniving nature of these religious Jews. Is the Roman commander just kind of dispassionate about this? You know, the Jews are like see their power being threatened, and he just wants to get back to Rome and climb the ladder or whatever. Pretty much. I, th I think probably so. Yeah. But he's having all these riots. There's been three riots now, and that looks bad on his record. So he's trying to get to the bottom of this. And he finally gets to the bottom that they're all going to bring him home. They're going to kill this guy. And then you're going to have more, right? And, you know, he's, he's, so I'm sure he's just saying, right. we got to deal with this. Yeah, we've got to deal with this. And we'll pre pretty much get to that starting next time. But um, Steve, wouldn't the Roman be considered a Gentile? He is a Gentile, absolutely. So yep. these folks are attacking him because he wants to... Uh, save the Gentiles. He does. Yes, he does. <laughs> and he is saving some of the Romans too. Absolutely. Yeah. So they they don't well, they they're not real happy with Rome at all. But Rome's allowing them to do what they need to do. But right now, we're going to see Rome going against him. You know. So uh, 
basically, um, once again, what we are, so what are we seeing here? We're seeing Rome protect Paul, aren't we? I mean, Rome, Rome has been repeatedly protecting Paul every time something has happened to him. And, and it's real interesting because in, Rome, in Acts 18, we saw Paul had a vision one night. And the Lord said to him, he said, don't be afraid any longer. Go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you. So Paul knows that God has told him that he's not going to be harmed. Of course, he did get, he did get pretty well beaten in that one place, but he wasn't killed. Um, Paul has been promised physical protection by God himself. And from that point on, Paul has been protected by Rome. Not abused by Rome, but he's been protected by Rome. That won't, that won't continue, but for right now, that's where we are. Well, Paul was in kind of a unique situation. He was living in a, in a Roman world as yep. a Roman citizen mm -hmm. and also in the Jewish world. So he, was, he had his feet in both worlds, and that, that was probably not common. Probably was. It might be why God used him, you know? Kind of yep. like that Kevin Costner movie when Kevin <laughs> went between the Indians and then a white soldier. And every time he got in trouble with the Indians, he said, I'm an Indian, I'm an Indian. Yeah. And then we <laughs> But he, okay. they stayed with Indians, didn't he? <laughs> 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 but he went back and forth. Yeah, but I, mean, but I mean, Paul definitely was the person. You know, he was Jew above Jews. You know, he knew the scripture. Old, old and, he, well, it wasn't no new. He was writing it. And, uh, but he, he was the perfect person for God to use, obviously. And, uh, and right now he's finding out what, how God is going to use him. And he's told, God told him, We're, you're going to go to Rome. So let's, it's going to take two years for him to get to Rome, but he knows he's headed there. All right, anything else? All right, let's pray.